Now that we've just about finished refactoring our WPF application to use vertical slice architecture, I want to demonstrate how to integrate a database, specifically via Entity Framework, into our architecture. So here in our vertical slice architecture application, this is secret message, a WPF application that simply displays a secret message to the authenticated user. So the feature I want to implement that we'll need a database for is auditing whenever the user views the secret message. So when we load up and put our secret message on the view model for the user to see, we want to write some auditing data, such as the user viewing the secret message, when the user viewed the secret message to the database. So this isn't really a new feature that we're implementing over in our features folder. We're just extending this view secret message feature. So in this load secret message command, right after we put the secret message on our view model to display it, we'd want to write out the viewed secret message auditing data. Or in other words, we want to audit the viewed secret message. So not very interesting or complex functionality, but just enough that we can demonstrate how to integrate a database into our vertical slice architecture. And again, we're going to be doing that via Entity Framework. So that being said, let's install packages so that we can use Entity Framework. And let's search for Microsoft.EntityFramework Core. And our project uses .NET 6. So we want to install Microsoft.EntityFramework Core version 6. So let's install that. For our database provider, we're simply going to use SQLite. So let's search for Microsoft.EntityFramework-Core.SQLite and install that. Again, matching our Entity Framework Core version of 6. Let's install version 6 of this package as well. And lastly, to generate migrations that will use to scaffold out our database, we need Microsoft.EntityFrameworkCore.Design. So let's install that again, version 6. And that should be all the packages that we need to use Entity Framework. So getting started with Entity Framework, the first thing we need is a DB context, which we'll use to interact with our database and define the entities that'll map to database tables. So let's think about where that's gonna fit into our vertical slice architecture. Well, we only need this DB context currently in this view secret message feature. So hey, why not put the DB context directly in this feature? That would work, but it's highly likely that the DB context would need to be used by many features. So it wouldn't make sense to put it just in a single feature since we need to reuse it throughout our application. That being said, it wouldn't make sense to put the DB context anywhere in our entities or features layer because the DB context is going to have to be used in those layers. It also wouldn't make sense to put it in the pages layer, of course, because the DB context is not a page. It also really wouldn't make sense to put it in the shared layer because my intention is for this shared layer to be application agnostic. So in other words, I should be able to copy anything from this shared layer and apply it to any WPF application. On the other hand, it would be nice to define the DB context in the shared layer because then all of our above layers could directly reference that DB context since the shared layer is the bottommost layer of our vertical slice architecture. However, I'm still not really sold on putting the DB context in the shared layer. Again, I wanted to be application agnostic. You can attempt to put it in the shared layer in your own application if you wish to. Maybe give it a try, apply your own vertical slice architecture rules depending on what your team agrees on. But in this scenario, since I don't want it in the shared layer, instead of putting it in the bottommost layer of our vertical slice architecture, let's put it in the topmost layer, the application layer. And I'd argue the application layer does somewhat make sense because it's going to encompass and aggregate all of the DTOs and entities in our underlying layers. So that being said, I feel good about having this in the topmost layer, the application layer. So in our application layer, Let's add a new folder for our database slice. We'll just call this folder database. And in this folder, let's add our DB context. So a class for our secret message DB context. And this will be our single DB context for our entire application. And that's another side note I wanted to bring up. Since we're using a code first approach in Entity Framework to scaffold out our database, we need to have a single DB context that'll include all the entities that we want to map to tables in that database. So based on that, we can't define an individual DB context for a specific slice. We need to forge ahead with one single root DB context with all of our entities. So forging ahead with this DB context, let's extend DB context and let's define a DB set for our viewed secret message auditing data. So we'll create a DTO for that in a second, but we'll call this DB set viewed secret messages and we should make that a public property. And now we need to define an entity 
or DTO type, whatever you want to call it, that'll contain the auditing fields that we want to map to the database. So this DTO, I'm going to define it in our view secret message feature. Again, with vertical slice architecture, we're going for cohesiveness. So I want to add it to this feature since the command in this feature is going to be responsible for saving that auditing data. So let's add this DTO. We'll call this the viewed secret message DTO. So again, representing the fields on our auditing database table. So we're going to need an ID on that table. We'll just make that a good for the ID. In terms of auditing data, I want to write out the ID of the user that's viewing the secret message. So let's call that user ID. Let's add a property for that. I also want a property for the secret message content. So that'll be a string for the content. So that's the message that they viewed. And finally, I want a date time, a date time offset actually, for the date time that the secret message was viewed. So we'll call this date viewed. So now that we have our DTO, let's define that as the type for our DB set and import that from our slice. And this is the correct flow of dependencies. Our application layer, specifically this database slice, is depending on our view secret message feature slice. So this will be all the DB sets that our DB context will need to define, but we'll also need to configure this DB context to point to a database. So that being said, we're gonna have to define a constructor that'll take in some DB context options. So let's define our constructor, which will need to take in DB context options. And we can just pass those options to the base constructor on the DB context. So let's pass in to this base constructor that already takes DB context options. And for our constructor, we'll just do nothing. So with that, our DB context is complete. We're not quite ready to use this throughout our application. There's a bit more that we'll have to do to support using this. But for now, I'm quite eager to generate some migrations and scaffold out our database via those migrations. So let's take our project and open this up in the terminal. And we'll need to run .NET EF migrations add, and we'll name our migration initial. And to use .NET EF, you'll need to install the Entity Framework tools. So I'll leave a link to that in the description. But let's run these migrations. Whoops, looks like I had a build failure. I just had to clean and rebuild. Let me try this again. So run migrations. And nice, this time we get a much better error message. So as expected, our Entity Framework migrations do not know how to create our secret message DB context. So in order to tell migrations how to create a DB context, we'll need to define a design time DB context factory. So let's add a class for that. We'll call this the secret message design time DB context factory. And we'll need to inherit from I design time DB context factory for our secret message DB context. Let's import that and implement this interface. And all we have to do is implement this function that'll tell migrations how to create our DB context. And in this function, we'll point our DB context to the database that we want to run migrations against. So we'll return an instantiated secret message DB context. We're going to create some DB context options via a DB context options builder which is quite pleasant to use. Let's import that. And all we want to tell this builder to do is use SQLite for our DB context options. And we can just pass in a connection string to our database. So the format for that is data space source equals and just the name of our database file that we want to generate. So we'll call this secret message dot DB. And finally, let's get those options from the DB context options builder by just calling the options property. So now that we have our design time DB context factory, let's try and run migrations again. And this time it is successful. So we get our migrations folder over here with migrations to create our database table. So next up, I want to run these migrations and actually generate our database tables. But instead of doing this from the command line, I want to do this automatically when our application starts. So that seems like something that we could put in this initialization slice specifically just in this application initializer. So this class is already pretty big and this initialize method already does a lot, but for simplicity, we're just gonna extend this to run database migrations. So we're gonna need our DB context in this application initializer, which means we'll need to resolve it from dependency injection. 
But we can't register the DB context directly in dependency injection because the entity framework DB context is not thread safe. So in other words, in order to prevent concurrency issues, we're gonna have to instantiate a new DB context for each set of database transactions in our application. So that being said, instead of injecting the DB context into this application initializer, we're gonna have to inject a DB context factory that we'll use to create a new DB context when we run our application initialization. So that being said, we're gonna need another class for our DB context factory. We'll call this the secret message DB context factory. And on here, we'll just have a single method to create our DB context. We'll just call it create and it'll return our instantiated DB context. And to instantiate this DB context, we'll need some options passed in. So we can just take those options through the constructor so that every client of this factory doesn't have to pass in options on its own when they call create. So we'll have a field for these DB context options and we'll take those through the constructor. So this DB context factory is different from the design time DB context factory because we're not hard coding the connection string. So instead for this regular DB context factory, we're gonna load up that connection string from our app settings and then register our DB context options in dependency injection so that we can resolve them in our DB context factory. Because for flexibility and in most cases security, we don't want to hard code and commit our connection string to source control. And I say in most cases because it doesn't really matter here since we're just pointing to a local database file. Although later we could ignore this design time DB context factory from source control, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Let's focus on our DB context factory, which is now ready to use. So we're going to use that in our application initializer to get a DB context. So let's define a field for that. Our secret message DB context factory. We'll just call it DB context factory. And we'll take this through the constructor. So let's add a parameter to our constructor. And then as part of application initialization, we'll create our secret message DB context using our DB context factory. So create a DB context. And using that context, we'll take our database and run migration. So we'll have to import migrate from Entity Framework Core. Can we do migrate async? Yes, we can. Let's do that instead. So call migrate asynchronously and let's await that. And of course, we need to put our DB context in a using statement so that we can dispose of it and close out the database connection when we're finished with it. So that should be good for running migrations. Last thing we need to do is if we want to inject this DB context factory, we're going to have to register it in dependency injection. So let's add some more extensions for adding our secret message DB context. So we're going to have another extension methods class in our dependency injection folder. So let me just copy one as a starting point. Let's copy this add user entity extensions and rename that to add secret message DB context extensions. Let's open up that file, rename this inner class, rename our actual extension method. And now all we need to do is add a singleton for our secret message DB context factory. Again, this can just be a singleton because all it does is create new DB context. It doesn't matter if this is shared as a single instance throughout our app. But in order to register this, we're also going to have to register our DB context options so that we can inject those here. So let's add those options as a singleton DB context options. And let's actually just copy the options from our design time DB context factory, since they're going to be the same pointing to our secret message DB file. So let's copy that, use those as our DB context options. And lastly, while we're here, instead of hard coding the connection string, let's load it up from our app settings.json. So let's open up our app settings dot json let's add an object for connection strings and we'll name our connection string sqlite and point it to our secret message dot db database file so with this defined in our app settings dot json we can load that up and pass it into our db context options so this configure services callback here there's an overload so that we can get the host builder context as well as the service collection and we can use this host builder context to 
dig into our loaded up application configuration. And in that configuration, we can get our connection string that we just defined in the app settings.json. So let's dig into that host builder context, look at the loaded up configuration, and we want to get a connection string. So let's import that extension method. And we named our connection string SQLite. So let's pass that in as the connection string name to this method. And that should load up our connection string, which we passed to our DB context options, which we used to instantiate our DB context. So last piece of the puzzle, all we need to do is call this extension method in our app.zamo.cs. So we want to add secret message DB context. So we should be good to generate our database and database table. We register our DB context factory in dependency injection. And then we use that in our application initializer to run our database migrations. So let me just put breakpoints everywhere and we'll make sure that this works. So let's run this. All right, so first step, we register our DB context factory. Let's make sure that we load up the connection string correctly. There we go, data source equals secret message DB. So DB context factory is registered. Here we go, we're gonna resolve this from dependency injection, which we did because our DB context factory field is defined. But now we're gonna create a DB context. So let's step over that. Here we go, creating the DB context. But finally, let's run migrations. Ooh, and we get an exception. Let's figure out what this could be. Seems like a missing connection string. That's interesting. Let me look a bit deeper. Oh, and here's the issue. So we get our connection string from our app configuration, but we didn't pass it into the use SQLite extension method. So let's pass that in for our DB context options. And this should work now. So let's make sure we got our breakpoint on the migrations. Let's see if they run successfully this time, which they should. Let's step over this. And there we go, migrations were successful. Let's just continue running the app. And let's find our database file in the bin. And here we go, we got a secret message.db that got generated when we ran migrations. So finally, we've set up Entity Framework. We're ready to use our DB context in our view secret message feature so that we can audit the viewed secret message. But wait a second, what the heck was I thinking? Because based on the rules that we've established for our vertical slice architecture, lower layers, such as the features layer, cannot reference higher layers, such as the application layer. So based on that, our view secret message feature is not going to be able to reference our secret message DB context. So how is our view secret message feature going to use the DB context to interact with the database? And the answer to that is that our view secret message feature just simply isn't going to directly reference our secret message DB context. Instead, we're gonna leverage an interface in our view secret message feature, and that interface will define all the requirements that a DB context will need in order to support this feature. And then we'll simply just need to implement that interface on our secret message DB context so that we can pass an instance of this DB context into our view secret message feature. So in other words, same approach that we've applied to other problems, we're gonna use an interface to invert the dependency between our application layer and our view secret message feature. So let's define our DB context interface and our view secret message feature. Then I'll define all of the DB context requirements to support this feature. We'll call it the I view secret message DB context. Whoops, this is supposed to be an interface, not a class. And to support our view secret message feature, a DB context is gonna need a DB set for the viewed secret message DTO, and it'll have to be named viewed secret messages, which is conveniently what we have named on our secret message DB context already. And on this interface, we just need this DB set property to at least have a getter. There might actually be more requirements that we need this interface to define, but let's get ready to use this finally in our load secret message command to audit the viewed secret message. So in this load secret message command, we're gonna need our DB context. Although same issue as we saw for the application initializer, instead of passing the DB context directly through the constructor, we're gonna need a DB context factory passed in. And again, that's actually especially important on this load secret message command because this is an async command that could technically be ran multiple times at once. So we'll need a new DB context instance each time we execute this command. So unfortunately, we're gonna need a db context factory passed to this command, 
but same issue as our DB context. The DB context factory lives all the way up in the application layer. So for now, let's just add an interface in our view secret message feature for a DB context factory. So we'll call this the I view secret message DB context factory. Whoops, again, I needed this to be an interface, not a class. And all this factory needs is a method that'll return an I view secret message DB context. We'll name this method create and it'll take in no parameters. So now we can reference this factory in our load secret message command. Let's add a field for that and define this as the DB context factory. Get that passed through the constructor and now we can use it. So let's use that factory to create our DB context. So take that factory and call create. We want to wrap all of this in a using statement so that we can dispose of our DB context and close out that database connection. Next up, let's create our viewed secret message DTO which will contain the auditing data that we want to write to the database. I suppose this doesn't need to go inside the using statement since we're not going to be using the DB context yet, but let's instantiate this. Let's just generate an ID with GUID, new GUID. The user ID, we could get that from our current user store. So let's grab the current user on there and get their ID, which we actually don't have a property defined on user yet for that. Whoops, we'll need to add that, but we can grab the content of the secret message. So let's just get that from the secret message response and grab the message. And finally, the date viewed, we'll use date time offset UTC now. So now that we have our DTO, we'll fix all of these errors in a second, but we can take our DB context, dig into the viewed secret messages DB set and add our DTO. And then we can take our DB context and save changes async. All right, so as expected, this interface was not complete. There's still a few more things we need to add to support how we want to use it. So for one, it's going to have to implement iDisposable since we'll want to want to dispose of this DB context. And then we'll also need a method that'll have to be async to save changes async and just take in no parameters. So based on that, this interface defines everything that we need in order to use it. Next up, our user needs an ID property. Let's just generate that. And we should be able to extract that from our auth user. And I suppose it's the local ID that we want. We'll have to take a look at that. But nonetheless, we now have an ID property on our user so that we can construct our DTO. So now we're just about done with our feature slice. Instead of referencing the DB context all the way up in our application layer, which we couldn't do, we defined interfaces that explicitly define all the functionality that we need our DB context to implement in order to support our feature. So based on that, our feature slice is very cohesive, actually highly reusable, and essentially defines everything that the slice needs. So what does this slice need now? It needs an I view secret message DB context and an I view secret message DB context factory. So to implement those interfaces, well, of course, we're just going to use our existing secret message DB context and just implement the interface defined in our view secret message feature. So the secret message DB context will implement the I view secret message DB context, which it does almost. It doesn't quite implement save changes async. I think the DB context signature for that method is slightly different, but let's just implement it on our own. And we can just forward this method to our base save changes async, which is on our base DB context. That'll do. And also in our view secret message slice, of course, we need an I view secret message DB context factory. So we can just implement this interface on our secret message DB context factory implementation. So let's implement that the I view secret message DB context factory, import that, implement the interface. And to implement this, we can just point to our existing create method, which will return our configured secret message DB context. So overall, our secret message DB context and DB context factory are essentially just going to aggregate and implement all of the interfaces required by underlying features and entities that need to use a database. So finally, almost ready to test this out and make sure it works, but we're gonna have to get this DB context factory passed through this load secret message command. 
So let's trace this back up. So we're gonna have to pass it in here in our home view model where we instantiate that command. So let's get the DB context factory passed through the home view model. There we go. We're also gonna need to add it to this load view model factory function so that we can forward it to our home view model constructor, which is getting very big. We could probably break down refactor and aggregate our view model services and commands a lot so that we're not passing in like six things through the constructor. But nonetheless, we'll keep it simple for demo purposes for now at least. And finally, when we call load view model, we need to pass in a DB context factory. So let's pass that in as another parameter and I view secret message db context factory and if we want to resolve this here we're gonna to have to register it so since this db context factory is part of our view secret message feature let's register it in the add secret message feature extension method so we're going to add a singleton for our i view secret message db context factory and the implementation will be the secret message db context factory let's import that which now implements our iViewSecretMessageDBContextFactory interface. These interfacing class names are so long, and I feel like I'm just rambling at this point. But nonetheless, we are now ready to test this out. We should have our dbContextFactory passed in, and we should be able to audit our data to the database. So let's try this out. We got our breakpoint ready. All right, so we create our DTO. The data on our new user ID property looks good. We got our secret message content. Let's create our DB context now via our DB context factory. There we go, that was successful. Let's add our DTO with the auditing data to our DB set. That's good. Now let's save changes async. Let's see. And seems like it was successful. I don't think we hit exceptions. Let's just hit it again to make sure. So let's view the secret message again. Step over this, save changes. There we go, that was successful, no exceptions. And if we go look at our database, we should see two records in there for the two times that we viewed the secret message. All right, I thought I had an extension to open up a SQLite database, but apparently I don't. So instead, let's use this online web app to browse our SQLite database. Hopefully this works, I've actually never tried this before. But let's go into our WPF application, go into the bin, look at our build, here we go, we got our database file. Let's open that. Here we go, we got our viewed secret messages database table. Let's take a look at that. And boom, looks like that's got our data. So the unique ID for the auditing record, our logged in user ID, the secret message, and the date time that we viewed it. So success, our vertical slice architecture application is leveraging a database via entity framework. So unfortunately, this was not quite simple. But just to summarize what we did, we added our DB context to our application layer. So again, this sits in the application layer, the top of our vertical slice architecture, and we'll essentially aggregate all of the DB sets that'll be required throughout our application. And this will be our single DB context to manage migrations and sessions against the database. And this DB context will also be responsible for implementing DB context interfaces, which define DB context requirements for slices in underlying layers, such as our view secret message feature slice. We also had to use a DB context factory so that we could instantiate a DB context per transaction and prevent any strange concurrency issues from DB context not being thread safe. And we also defined a design time DB context factory so that we could generate migrations. In fact, let's ignore this from source control so let me get into my git ignore and just ignore this design time db context factory file. There we go. Not getting tracked by source control now. But after generating migrations, we updated our application initializer to run those migrations against our database and scaffold out our database tables. So this will automatically keep our database up to date with the latest migrations. And then finally, in our view secret message feature, we defined an interface that defined DB context requirements in order to use the view secret message slice. And then finally, we referenced our DB context to implement our auditing behavior and save our viewed secret message audit data to the database. And between all of this work, there was also some dependency injection updates to register everything that we needed. But overall, with the approach that we've taken, we passed along more responsibility to our feature and entity slices, which ultimately allows them to be more cohesive. I will say it is a bit inconvenient 
that we couldn't define an individual DB context for our specific slice. Because if we could just directly implement a viewed secret message DB context rather than defining an interface, then we really wouldn't need all of these interfaces at all. We could just have the actual DB context implementation living in the slice. But we couldn't take that approach since we're using code first migrations. And I suppose that's a side effect of using code first entity framework in vertical slice architecture. So that being said, I'm a bit curious to see what it'd be like using Dapper instead as our database RRM. Would that be more pleasant for vertical slice architecture? Perhaps we'll just have to find out. Aside from that, hopefully you can apply these concepts in your own vertical slice architecture application to support database interactions via entity framework. If you have any questions, criticisms, or concerns, be sure to leave those below in the comments section. If you enjoyed the video or are enjoying the channel, consider becoming a member. Other than that, leave a like or subscribe for more. Thank you.